Hello everyone, this is Crazy Flying Chicken, back with Weekly War Report number 30. Now before I jump into the game, I wanted to talk really quickly about the strategy uh, of the map, because there were some pretty important changes to Endless Shore that's going to change the way that the map is played. It's important to mention that these changes were, were pretty tacked on by the devs in the last uh, patch, so I would expect there to be a lot more changes coming up. But that being said, there's no reason why we can't dissect the map now and, and see what we can learn from the changes that were implemented. So the first and, and major changes uh, that we've seen were the central bridge here going between Well and Tawatha and this general area here at Saltbrook Channel. So this part uh, upset, it, upset a lot of people because it, was, it, seemed, it looks different and scary. And, uh, but actually, this is a really interesting scenario that I think is fairly balanced that uh, some people may not realize just by looking at it first glance. So I want to look at that a little bit more closely about this particular area here. Because this, to me, is the most interesting change and un the most unique part of this map uh, in this iteration. So I'm going to zoom into that area a little bit to this and uh, sort of give you a clear idea of how this area might be balanced. So this is the warden side of the river controlled by the wardens and you can still and the southern side of the map is controlled by the colonials and you can sort of see just by breaking it down to this uh, narrow perspective how the how it's sort of balanced um, the warden supply line runs this way so it runs from brackish point to saltbrook channel the only way for the wardens to utilize this refinery is by mining scrap at this node or at this node here. Meanwhile, the Colonials similarly have to run a, a supply line from the refinery that's not in Saltbrook over here at the well, running it west towards this salvage node that's inside well. So you can see right away that the supply lines are very similar. So it's not unbalanced in that respect, that the supply lines towards Saltbrook are almost equidistant, even though it looks like, because the refinery is here in Saltbrook, that the Wardens might have an advantage they still need to bring in build, or, uh, salvage parts in order to refine them to, uh, to push Saltbrook. So in a way, they're both the same. So with that in mind, the Colonials do have one major advantage in that it is that it has a town hall inside the town. At the start of the game, this is an advantage because it's outside of mortar range of the far side of the river. But once artillery starts to hit the field, you can destroy that town hall from way back here, almost from the refinery. So it's not... The, the town hall, once artillery hits, uh, becomes almost an, a moot point, and the, uh, the Colonials are forced to use a similar FOB further back to the rear. So one other major advantage that the Colonials hold is the salvage node. It, to me, it, it is an advantage to have the salvage node at the front rather than having the refinery, uh, for the reasons in one of my previous videos with the... Uh, with the sense of the logistics. So the salvage node actually acts as a bit of a fortification because if you have four players mining the salvage node and one person running materials back and forth, that means that there's actually four players that are garrisoned here in Saltbrook at all times mining the salvage node for that truck running back and forth, whereas the wardens are almost garrisoned way back here in this salvage node with four guys running uh, bu mining build materials to ship to this refinery. So that it's almost like the Wardens are, are not encouraged to stay inside Saltbrook, whereas the Colonials are. So in that way, it has a, a slight Colonial advantage. So that, and because there is a, uh, a couple more refineries, or, or one more refinery and more vehicle factory, oh, sorry, not vehicle factory, weapons factories down in Enduring Post down south, you can actually bring a hell of a lot of weapons to bear in Saltbrook if you so chose. You could bring up uh, um, two more uh, the production capacity of two more work, uh, one more workshop and two weapons factories, as well as the two weapons factories from the well and the two that are already in Saltbrook. So you could have a lot of weapons pumped into Saltbrook from the colonial side, whereas the wardens are forced to bring it all the way from down in Tuatha or over in uh, Volpine Ledge, basically all the way across the map. So the wardens don't really have that luxury of being able to increase their production capacity to protect Saltbrook if necessary. So going back to this map, uh, the overview map, now that we can see how this, uh, how the uh, northwestern side of the map looks, we can sort of understand that at the start of the game, yes, the wardens have a advantage because you can see they almost start with an extra town. They start with half of Saltbrook, Brackish Point, Tuatha Watch Post, Lights End, and Volpine Ledge, whereas the Colonials start with almost half a town here in Saltbrook 
and then three towns at the well and during post in Woodbine. So the it, it looks right away like the wardens have an advantage, except that because of those reasons we identified, this area should, all, all else being equal, this area should fall to the colonials. Um, Saltbrook, and, and again, I'm going to reiterate it because now you can see the whole map. Saltbrook has a lot that the colonials can bring to bear. It can bring two weapons factories here, two weapons factories here, and two here. So you can bring six in a reasonably short supply distance, whereas the wardens have to bring it from all the way over here or all the way over here in order to equalize the amount of weapons factories that are producing into Saltbrook. So again, all things being equal, Saltbrook should fall to the colonials. So with that, so with that in mind, let's assume that uh, let's assume that the colonials do eventually capture Saltbrook. Then we can we almost look like, it almost looks like the opposite is true because Brackish Point becomes an almost ten, untenable defense point for the wardens because if the colonials have a a refinery here at Selbrook, then they can push easily into Brackish Point with a minimal supply line, whereas the wardens have to push a supply line further across this bridge or even further from Volpine Ledge. So Brackish Point is almost a, a, almost a given when uh, Selbrook Channel falls. But with that in mind, the, the wardens still have Kelpie's Main, which is still a warden-controlled bridge, or should be, because the refineries for the colonials are much further back. So if uh, we talked about this again in one of the previous videos, but you can see how the supply line uh, for both teams is equally distant on the colonial side of Kelpie's Main. So if the Warden so chose to push Woodbind, then it seems to be that the colonials wouldn't have much hope of keeping them on the north side of Kelpie's Main if the Wardens were determined. So the map is still, in my opinion, fairly balanced, but it's not... It's not perfect. Okay, so let's jump into the game here. So this game was exciting because it was the first time we'd ever managed to fill a server up with 120 clanned players. And what this meant was that we saw an unprecedented amount of coordination on Endless Shore for the first time ever. What this means is that we saw a lot of stalemates. And the reason for that being is because I think the devs are still experimenting a lot with how bridges work and their mechanics. And I think we want to see how the... It's, it's exciting to see how an organized group might tackle these issues. So this game lasted almost two whole days and I wasn't present for all of it. But I did manage to talk to a good number of people and get their sort of general, general feelings for the game. But it's been a challenge to try to figure out how I'm going to show this game to you guys without seeming biased or... Uh, without uh, without interpreting the complete strategies of all the different teams. So the way I, I've decided to do this is to basically talk about the stalemates, because this game was defined by its stalemates. We saw defensive lines that were 10 layers thick in this game, and I think that that's, as, as boring as that sounds to look at or, or to see, I think it's really exciting in that we the coordination and uh, the communication between the team or between the clans uh, really made that a, a resounding success. In in a random game, we don't see that kind of commitment. We don't see how uh, the the defensive lines could be theoretically built and made to be impregnable. So, in that way, this game was really exciting. We can see brand new strategies that we've never seen before because of how coordinated both sides were. So after the first 20 minutes, uh, the map looked a bit like this. And that's pretty much to be expected. So the, the battle line was basically drawn across the rivers, and we can see where all the, uh, the main static bottlenecks were. So reinforcing my point earlier about how this game was defined by its stalemates, this was one of the most, uh, the most tenuous stalemates that we'd seen, because there weren't a lot of defenses yet set up. Both sides had basically rushed to hold these bridges, and nobody had yet to set up meaningful defenses, so these bridges continuously got blown up. Especially this one between uh, Well and Tuatha. This one got uh, rebuilt, uh, I think, twice. Um, but the reason why these stalemates persisted for so long, uh, 
I think this one this one lasted for maybe eight hours, uh, was because every time one side decided to push across the bridge, uh, the other side would redirect their forces and push back. So we saw a couple of times at the start of the game, the colonials would push across the bridge to Tawatha watch post, then the wardens would push back, and every time something like that happened, the, the wardens would redirect people from less uh, active fronts to reinforce that defensive line, and similarly, the colonials, whenever the wardens pushed, would redirect players to protect the well. So this was really cool because because there was so much communication between the clans that we were able to do this sort of thing that um, almost like it was almost an overreaction when even just a couple of wardens broke across into the well, uh, an inordinate number of colonials would show up to defend it. And uh, similarly with Tawatha whenever the colonials pushed across. So that was exciting in that we haven't seen that level of maneuverability from either side on a, on a full scale before. So all 60 players reacting to enemy pushes. Now the first breach of that stalemate that I was made aware of was Kelpie's main uh, was pushed um, almost to a, a kind of like kill zone on the far side. Um, meanwhile, the warden's doing similarly the same thing on this, on the well, getting a beachhead on that side. Uh, but Saltbrook being largely, un, or largely untouched. There was a lot of mortar shelling in uh, Saltbrook from both sides, but because neither side could really could cross in order to secure the bridges. Uh, Saltbrook remained a largely contested town without any real fighting going on for uh, for at least the first couple of hours. But eventually, after the first maybe eight hours, um, we started to see some major pushes from the wardens into Saltbrook Channel, and this happened by grace of artillery. So this was, again, probably about five or six hours into the game when the Wardens started producing howitzers to start shelling Saltbrook Channel um, and similarly building howitzers to assault well. And uh, I believe they I don't believe they used any howitzers on Kelpie's main, but I could be wrong about that. But the, the point being that the Wardens had beaten us to howitzers, and that was due largely to miscommunication between... Uh, Pug and a new group called the CCA, which is a collection of colonial alliance or colonial clans, uh, but uh, whereas the uh, the tech was split between Enduring Post and the Well, so we didn't have uh, we didn't get howitzers very quickly, and eventually the uh, the howitzers at Saltbrook Channel were enough to allow the wardens to rebuild these bridges and open up a brand new front, and. With the town hall being so close to the front, just having the wardens on the colonial side of the river meant the town hall kept getting knocked out, which is why this FOB was erected as a kind of fallback position. And that was really cool, too, because what it meant was we had a battle through the town. So this whole town became a battle zone, uh, with the wardens pushing south and the colonials spawning from the well, running over here to uh, support weathered, uh, weathered landing FOB. And eventually the, war, the Colonials did manage to push back, but Saltbrook Channel was never quite the same. Uh, it was almost like it was shell-shocked. Because the Wardens had pushed through with such a tremendous force, and because all the defenses at Saltbrook were wiped out, Saltbrook remained, for the majority of the game, a largely un, undefended and uncontested area. Or, sorry, an undefended and contested area. So the Wardens kept pushing across, clearing out all the defenses. The Colonials would keep pushing back up, pushing them out, and then building a light layer of defenses for the next time the Wardens would push across and retake Saltbrook Channel. And I would say maybe after 12 hours of fighting, eventually uh, the Wardens lost, or the uh, Colonials lost Saltbrook Channel, and uh, the Wardens began their push on the well from two sides. And this was pretty significant because the colonial supply base was largely, at least the pug supply base, was set up here in Weathered Landing, and a lot of the clans were beginning to log off. So the well was basically isolated and eventually flipped for the wardens. So now the map looked like this, and we were entering into the second level, of, or the second layer of uh, stalemates that were uh, going on. And again, this is a very top-down view of it because there were obviously a lot more FOBs than this. I'm only putting on the most important ones. And 
there was a lot more back and forth than this. Like it looks pretty linear that the wardens had pushed across Saltbrook, but the reality is that Saltbrook had fallen back to the colonials maybe five or six times. Uh, the uh, pushes up and down weathered landing by both colonials and the wardens were numerous and bloody. Um, even uh, in the evening of, uh, even in Saturday evening, the colonials had even retaken everything. They'd taken Saltbrook and they'd taken well back, but by dawn of the following day on Sunday, uh, everything was back to normal with the wardens in control of Well and Saltbrook. So even though I'm, I'm not talking a lot about it, um, I wanted to reiterate that I'm focusing mostly on the stalemates here because this stuff is really not relevant to the overall strategy of the game. Of the game. There was a lot of fighting and there was a lot of heroics on both sides, but let's be honest, if you can't hold the ground for a long period of time, then it's not really your ground. So the map looked like this. Again, I'm also understating the amount of conflict that was going on at Kalpies. I know there was a lot of fighting going on back and forth, but ultimately no ground was gained. The Both sides had pushed uh, either side of the river and there were layers and layers of defenses on both sides. So largely this was the map. This is what it looked like going into Sunday. And this was an interesting stalemate because um, it was broken twice. Uh, first by the Colonials and then by the Wardens. So the Colonials, having been pushed back to Enduring, uh, had to hold these two bridges. There was actually another wooden bridge here that's not on the map, but it is certainly there, but you can't get vehicles across it, so it's not as strategically important. However, it is tactically significant. So the Colonial supply line was ridiculously short now because all it had to do to get to the bridge was bring it up from Saltbrook. Uh, with soldier supplies coming from Woodbind and uh, medical as well. And the Warden supply line had to come all the way from Well to support Weathered Landing as well as, uh, or otherwise, come from Saltbrook uh, Refinery. So the Wardens had a lot further to go, which meant the Colonials had the advantage at retaking this bridge. So we learned a lot about how to retake bridges. <clears throat> now, it's the, the meta is still going to advance a lot. This is really the first time we've seen organized groups try to take bridges, and what we learned was that these bridges are technically impregnable. Um, wardens, the wardens that were very effective at using artillery and mortar to keep this bridge from being rebuilt, because the colonials wanted to push north again and retake Saltbrook. What the wardens had done was set up basically an artillery piece over a hundred meters back that would just shell the bridge every time it got to be rebuilt. They also had an FOB back here that was just out of artillery range that they were using to supply their men with mortar. So if the Colonials tried to rebuild this bridge, they would get hammered by artillery and mortar. And the mortar wasn't necessarily as critical as this artillery piece because we could not counter-battery it. It was far enough away on their side of the river that there was no artillery position we could possibly set up that would allow us to knock that out. Uh, in, in order for us to rebuild the bridge. So every time we tried to rebuild the bridge, a shell would come in, knock it out, and we'd be back at square one. So theoretically, it is possible for a single warden with a good supply line using an artillery piece to hold off an entire advance of 60 colonials. 60 colonials would not be able to break this bridge or rebuild this bridge if there was a single warden manning an artillery piece back here and that's something that might need to be addressed um, either the bridges under construction will need to be more resistant to blast damage or there needs to be uh, a way to cross a river that doesn't involve constru constructing a bridge like a shallow crossing uh, similar to what we saw uh, what we see on Kelpie's main if there's no way to cross the bridge then there, if there's if the enemy has a, a well fortified position on the far side of the bridge, technically the bridge is in, unbreachable. But thankfully there is this this second wooden bridge which the colonials used to cross. Now we could force this one because it was far enough away from the the roads that the wardens couldn't possibly supply an artillery piece enough to keep that bridge down. They did try, but the because the supply line from the colonials was so short, we managed to get that bridge rebuilt several times in order to push across. And what ended up happening was we'd have colonials pushing across this bridge and attacking the far side of the bridge from, uh, from a flank while the logistics team stayed here and supported with artillery firing across the river, which was really cool. Okay, because you'd love, that's what this game is all about, is about using the, the tools you have available to come up with a dynamic way to, uh, 
to circumvent these these blockades. And the warden position, even with the artillery here, even if it was just under assault, it was enough to allow the colonials to rebuild this bridge. And it took several attempts to do this, but we did manage to get that bridge rebuilt. We did manage to destroy the, uh, the warden FOB, and we did manage to cross. But it's still important to recognize that even with a zero a zero range supply line, the colonials needed to get creative about taking this bridge back. And again, if it was the prerogative of the clans to make sure that the colonials never crossed these two bridges, it would have been as simple as keeping two guys with two artillery pieces way back and always shelling the bridge whenever they got built. <clears throat> so again, that's something that might need to be addressed, but in the meantime, what, it was cool because the Colonials were finally able to push back into Saltbrook and retake it. But once again, the, uh, the status quo returned to normal after an, uh, about maybe six hours, the Wardens had pushed back into Saltbrook, and again from Brackish Point, and then further on down south back into Weathered Landing to put up a defensive line along the shore. So again, we go back to an unbroken stalemate. Uh, right at the uh, end of the war, this is almost 48 hours later, the uh, Colonials were right back to defending this line, and the Wardens uh, were defending against a push from Colonials coming across this bridge. So the Colonials had had enough of uh, fighting for Saltbrook and decided they were going to go for well. So the Wardens had to f deal with defending the landing at Weathered Landing, as well as the push from the well. Now, it wasn't enough. The uh, It was getting late in the evening already and players were beginning to drop off, so this attack eventually failed and was pushed back. And from what I gathered, the end of the game happened when there weren't a hell of a lot of people online, but the Wardens pushed across this bridge in a fairly linear fashion. They didn't necessarily need to use this bridge because there weren't a lot of Colonials on to defend it. And they pushed across into Enduring Post and took it, basically under cover of darkness. And after that, the Colonials were left with only Woodbine, and it was game over. So the major battles, or the major stalemates that we saw, uh, were on, there were only two that managed to drag the game on for almost 48 hours. But I think that we will see some major changes to the map that will make this less painful. And I think that we are still learning as a community how to breach these bridges correctly. Um, random players don't necessarily put a lot of thought into how they do things, they just sort of do them. So the randoms right now are just running at these bridges and doing it the hard way by uh, basically sheer sheer willpower, uh, not a lot of strategic val not a lot of strategic thinking. So once we've established a meta for crossing these defended bridges, uh, hopefully we'll see the randoms just sort of adopt those strategies and then maybe these bottlenecks will become less severe. But in the meantime, uh, like I said, I think this map is going to see some major changes. There's a lot of things that could be done to make it more interesting. But for now, I thought it was a hell of a game. It was one awesome game put up by all clans involved. Um, I think we need to shout out, the, we need to give a shout out to 501st Edge, Cas uh, Edge sorry, 501st Edge, uh, 82DK and Ass, which were all playing on the Warden's side, as well as the Colonial side, which was 42DR, uh, T1BWR, I'm not sure if that's, uh, I'm not sure what that stands for, uh, 10CCE, um, I know I'm going to forget a few here, BLD, Pug, and just the, the Colonial randoms and Warden randoms in general, everybody was working together in such an incredible display of teamwork that this game is only getting better and better, and as we go on into the next couple of weekly wars, we're going to hopefully see some really interesting plays coming out. So that's it for now. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, this is Crazy Flying Chicken. Please like and subscribe. Thanks. Bye.